the world needs to hear this. Showing how these reptilian bloodlines in this Chittahuli, this reptilian group, expanded their power across the world. This is what this nonsense is all about. There are lies. There are big lies. They are... There are enormous lies. There are gigantic whoppers. You're dealing with people you cannot rationally have a conversation with. Welcome to Ike Land, the podcast where I, Thomas Robertson, he, him, take you on a journey through the world of British conspiracy theorist David Ike, a self-confessed, tireless campaigner for truth. We're starting a new series today where I'll be reading and commenting on Ike's latest book, The Trap, which came out in August of 2022 through Ike's iconic publishing. Before we begin, I want to give a hearty thank you to Elise Cabray for the new music at the start there. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? I love it. I'm, I'm just absolutely chuffed with it. I think she did an incredible job. Please go and support Elise. Uh, she publishes music on YouTube under the name How to Stare at Ceilings. Let's spring the trap, shall we? First and foremost, I have to credit Ike's son Gareth, who designed the cover. It's modern, it's contemporary, it's uh, pretty innocuous. It doesn't give off the same weird New Age vibes that some of Ike's earlier books did. Uh, definitely wouldn't look out of place on a shelf in any major metropolitan bookshop. You'd certainly walk past it without thinking too much about it. Uh, the cover art is goldfish in a bowl floating in the ocean with mountains in the background. He's managed to create an interesting visual metaphor for his father's message. So, Ike's whole thing is essentially that we're unwitting prisoners unaware of our containment and the boundaries which hem us in, hence the glass bowl in the ocean, beyond which an endless greater consciousness awaits us if we could just wake up. Illustrations and photos resembling memes appear frequently throughout the book. Uh, you know, I say resembling memes because we've got the we've got top text we've got more text across the bottom but the images aren't quite memes and they don't fully encapsulate an idea or a joke and they couldn't stand on their own but they're facebook-esque but i don't anticipate seeing them shared around just yet but you know they wouldn't look too out of place there either as for the content the book sucks <laughs> there's just there's just no getting around it. It sucks. Ike badly needs an editor. Reading the book is comparable to being stuck sitting next to a grumpy old man on the bus. And the grumpy old man just won't stop telling you these long and pointless stories, you you know, about people you've never heard of and places you've never been to and how things were 30 odd years ago in this long stream of consciousness that is punctuated by offensive and out of touch opinions that just you know, they just slip in occasionally enough to just jolt you out of your sleep and wake you back up again. Ike gives us his usual spiel about the secret rulers of the world. Plus, we get the appearances of usual suspects, Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab. For those of you playing along at home and keeping score, Bill Gates is mentioned 45 times, but Klaus Schwab just edges out Bill and takes home the victory with 47 mentions. Ike also manages to include a diatribe against trans individuals, as well as a diatribe against woke culture, as well as denial of COVID-19, climate change, and HIV AIDS. So, you know, fun for the whole family. Offensive content aside, I did disturb my wife a few times with laughter as I was reading in bed. There is gold in them thy hills. Uh, highlights include salivating surgeons dripping into their patients, Bill Gates' Japanese breeding program for vaccine-spreading mosquitoes, and Ike complaining that Joe Rogan keeps declining his request to appear on Rogan's podcast. Sounds like a bit of a point of contention for poor old Dave. The Trap is 600-odd pages long, with the first three chapters taken up with Ike's autobiography. I assume this detailed autobiography is for the benefit of new readers that Ike is hoping to have attracted post-COVID popularity bump. But, at 150 pages, it's far too long. There are some highlights, though. 
Mike's early start as a professional footballer at age 15 is interesting, as is his relationship with his father. The end of his football career at 19 due to rheumatoid arthritis is uh, genuinely heartbreaking, and his transition to journalism is interesting. I'd say that Ike could whittle this 150 pages down to a solid 30 pages for a really good introduction, but unfortunately Ike doesn't seem to have a editor, so we're left with, you know, whatever Ike saw fit to print, basically. I guess that's the um, trepidatious nature of being self-published. No one to tell you no. We do get a lot of baby photos and early school photos. Lots of football photos, as you'd expect. Ike's glory days, after all. I will say this. Ike was a cute baby. After those initial chapters, Ike starts playing his hits. We get revelations about the secret rulers of the world, how the rulers of the world alter our perceptions, the true nature of reality, etc, etc. We also get plenty of Ike's rhetoric about COVID-19 denial, including his nonsense about quote-unquote evidence of how COVID-19 vaccines are poison and masks are mind control. The exciting parts of the book are Ike's revelations about reincarnation. Typically for an Ike book, we have a lot of information, quote-unquote, but no bibliography. Where Ike does make a reference, it's vague. Ike repeats throughout the book how clever and what an independent free thinker he is for, for uncovering all that he has about the world, despite the fact that he left school at age 15 and has had no further formal education beyond that final year in secondary school. While I'm certainly not knocking anybody who has left school early, many pro people do for a lot of reasons, particularly in the decades past. But Ike mentions it so many times that it stings of either insecurity or arrogance. He also spends pages telling us that formal education is indoctrination into the cult way of thinking and designed to close our minds off from the truth, particularly in the case of universities. All of this is to say, Ike tries to turn what could be a criticism of him into a strength. A self-professed rebel by nature, free from cult indoctrination at the woke universities, Ike is able to see through the mendacity and deceit of the system to learn not just the truth of the world-controlling cult, but the nature of reality itself. Which, to his benefit, he's now able to sell to people through lectures, books, videos, and memberships to his streaming site. So, a real rags-to-riches story. We'll start our look at the trap with the first few chapters looking at Ike's football career, before we move on to his spiritual awakening in the next episode. The first chapter of the trap is called We Are Here to Remember and leads with a quote from journalist James Dellingpole, which reads, David Icke is a visionary genius. Anyone who doesn't realise this at this late stage of the game is deluded, ignorant or foolish. Icke opens an acknowledgement of the quote, writing, Who would have thought, amid the decades of ridicule and abuse, that those words would have been written one day by our respected, proper journalist about that nutter, David Icke? Very close to no one. Because Ike doesn't reference any sources, I had to look up the context of the quote. This quote from Dellingpool is a tweet from November 24th, 2021, and Dellingpool doesn't elaborate. Dellingpool is a proper journalist? Yes. Respected? Uh... He does seem like the kind of bloke Ike would like. Dellingpool denies anthropogenic climate change, and is particularly averse to wind farms. He's called for Nuremberg-style trials to be held for climate scientists and climate campaigners, and although Dellingpole claimed the calls for trials to be metaphorical, he has repeatedly incited violence against the climate scientists and campaigners, some of whom he has singled out by name. In the Rutledge Handbook of Environmental Journalism, Dellingpole is described as detached from reality. On a fun note, he claims to have smoked pot at university with David Cameron. Dellingpole has described himself as a member of probably the most discriminated against subsection in the whole of British society, the white, middle-aged, public school and Oxbridge-educated middle-class male. So, join me in a collective, ugh, spare us. Anyway, Ike kicks off and the first few pages read like a manic episode. Here's a sample. Perception eddies continue to spin while the rest of the river infinite possibility, flows by unseen and unacknowledged. I decided when my mind awakened in 1990 and then crashed open early the following year that I was going to speak my truth, 
No level of abuse was going to stop me. To put this in human terms, I am a stubborn bastard. So stubborn, in fact, that like the keystone of an archway, the more pressure you apply, the stronger I get. This strength is not human. It is beyond human. I am not human. Neither are you. Human is the great illusion and the foundation of our mass servitude. We are not human. We are consciousness having a brief experience called human. Here lies the revelation that will set us free. I am living an amazing life. Amazing. And I would not change a day of it. The good, bad, or the bits in between. If I did, I would break the interconnectedness that has shown me so much on so many levels and in so many facets that have conjured the magic that has led me to where I am today. I love where I am today, so why would I want to change the incredible tapestry of experience that got me here? I would, however, like to change many of the things I have been made aware of in a life of extraordinary synchronicity since my consciousness exploded awake in 1990 and 91 and I was launched into a blaze of mass ridicule and abuse and ultimately, three decades later, to vindication. Possibly hundreds of millions around the world have acknowledged my vindication and more all the time, while there are still many who seek to avoid the blatant truth that I have been vindicated. They can do so only through self-deception. I have said for those more than 30 years that current events were coming, and here they are. The question is how? How did I know? Why are things that I said which are most far out increasingly being supported by mainstream scientists? After all, I left school at 15 to play professional football with no exam certificates. To the intellectual mind, that is a paradox. How could I know without a proper education? I could know because the world is not what people think it is. More to the point, are told it is. The intellectual mind must be the servant of expanded states of consciousness. Instead, the intellect has long been the master and not the servant. When that happens, the cell door slams shut on wisdom, on knowing, and our world is the result. It continues like that until, with uncharacteristic brevity, Ike sums up his reason for riding the trap. I have learned, the real term should be remembered, as we'll see, so many things including the fact that there is no death, and what we call death is only a transition between different expressions of life. Far from being pawns in someone else's game, we can control our experienced reality if we know how to do so. If we don't, then we are pawns in someone else's game, and that's the stark situation that almost everyone faces. I have learned, remembered, the nature of the psychopathic force behind all of this, how it operates through hidden networks, and to what end. Knowing the what end has allowed me to predict current events. I have also shown, to allow me to remember, that what we call the human world is a massively advanced version of virtual reality computer system created to entrap our sense of reality and imprison our lower consciousness in an ever-recycling feedback loop between different levels of this simulation, or matrix. David Vaughan Ike was born on April 29th, 1952. So, happy birthday for the other day, David. I'm recording this on the 3rd of May, the day before my birthday. So, how about that? David was born to mother Barbara Ike and father Barrick Ike in Leicester, England. The Ikes were a working-class family living in social housing. Barrick Ike worked in a number of manufacturing jobs, and Barbara was a stay-at-home mum to David, his older brother Trevor, and younger brother Paul. The anecdotes that Ike chooses to include here about his parents are interesting. Many of them, in one way or another, include some element of deception, an authority figure behaving badly, or someone misusing a position of influence. All of which are foundational of Ike's conspiracy work. It's interesting to me, at least, that he would choose to present his parents in the same way. Ike doesn't write much about his mother, but he does share this. When I was still in a pram, she would walk the streets to deliver to shops the toys my father made at Christmas to bring in a few more pennies. He would use round pie tins to make toy banjos, and the first Christmas present I remember was a big wooden bus that he made for me. My mother would tell the shops that she was delivering on my pram because the van had broken down. A van we never had. Then there were the many times the council rent man knocked on the door and my mother would go, shh, to me and pull me behind the settee. 
I didn't know what was happening at first, but I learned that when the rent man got no answer, he often didn't from people who couldn't pay the rent that week, he would peer through the front window. Hence, if we were in the front room at the time, we hid behind the settee. Now, I'll admit that these are white lies and aren't on the magnitude of the plots and schemes Ike usually writes about. It is a curiosity, though. Ike continues the trend with the presentation of his father. My father was a rebel in the military, too, and got away with it a lot. He was willing to do things that others wouldn't do, which included picking up body parts of those blown to pieces and sending them home in coffins weighed down with ballast so their families believed it contained a full body when it was only a few pieces. The authorities needed him, and he took full advantage of that. He was part of a plan to falsely diagnose with tuberculosis a highly dangerous officer whose idiocy was getting many killed. The move ensured the officer would be sent home to England and no longer able to cause this deadly mayhem. When Berwick won the British Empire Medal for pulling pilots and crew from a crash-landed blazing plane at Chipping Warden Airfield in Oxfordshire, he became pretty much untouchable. He would be picked up from local pubs in the evening, poured into a truck, poured into bed, and be ready for work the next morning. No action was ever taken against him. He was too invaluable, and his medal was his protection. Unfortunately, I can't verify these stories about Berwick in the military, but entertaining the notion that the stories about the weighted coffins and the falsely tubercular officer are true, again, we have stories about Ike's parents involved in subterfuge. The removed officer is an example of an authority figure behaving badly, assuming the story is true, of course, as would be the officer's superiors for not removing him from his position. We also have Berwick himself behaving badly, getting pissed at the pub knowing he won't be reprimanded for being unfit for duty the next day. I can't offer any insight into why Ike has chosen to present his parents like this. I just find it interesting. Maybe Ike can only see the world, including his own family and history, through the conspiratorial lens he views the rest of the world through. I was able to verify the circumstances Berwick was awarded his British Empire Medal, and it's a shame Ike didn't elaborate as it's actually a great story. I was able to find a notice of the award in a supplemental to the London Gazette, published on May 11th, 1943. It reads, One night in March 1943, an aircraft crashed on a Royal Air Force station and immediately burst into flames. Squadron leader Moore, the duty medical officer, saw the accident and, accompanied by leading aircraftman Ike, a medical orderly, proceeded to the scene. Squadron leader Moore directed the removal of the rear gunner, who was dazed and sitting amongst the burning wreckage to a place of safety. The aircraft was now enveloped in flames and ammunition was exploding. Nevertheless, despite the intense heat and the danger from exploding oxygen bottles, this officer and airman entered the burning wreckage in an attempt to rescue another member of the crew who was pinned down. Without any protective clothing, they lifted aside the burning wreckage and, with great difficulty, succeeded in extricating the injured man. Squadron leader Moore rendered first aid to the rescued man. Squadron leader Moore sustained burns to his chest and hands in carrying out the operation. This officer and airman both displayed courage and devotion to duty in keeping with the highest traditions of the Royal Air Force. Barrack deserves recognition for what is a true act of courage. You'll notice here that Barrack is identified as a medical orderly. Ike writes that Barrack had always hoped to become a doctor, but was never able to achieve his dream because of his working class background. Nevertheless, Ike praises him as a brilliant, self-taught physician. In a display of Barrack's medical knowledge and in keeping with Ike's hostility to doctors, Ike writes about Beric and the family GP, Dr. Redizich. Dr. Redizich was always writing a prescription before you finished saying how you felt. Time and again, I would tell my father about Redizich's diagnosis, and he would say he was wrong. Beric's medical conclusions invariably turned out to be correct. Like all fathers, Beric was a role model for his sons. And like all fathers, Beric was imperfect. Ike writes, Beric's challenges and life experiences didn't make him the easiest man to live with. He was angry and frustrated at the world, and he could have a short fuse. Behind that was a sense of decency, and he cried easily at the sight of injustice. I was brought up in an atmosphere of questioning authority, and never giving up. My father told me at a young age, you were never finished until you tell yourself you're finished. Ike shares an anecdote about his father standing up to authority. He was urged by fellow workers in a shoe factory to represent them over poor treatment by the bosses. And when he did, he was sacked on the spot. He told me how he picked up some possessions from his work spot, and all those who had urged him to represent them, because they daren't, sat with their heads down, refusing to make eye contact as he walked out with another income gone. However, 
The lesson Ike learned from his father's attempt to improve the working conditions for himself and his colleagues is an unfortunate one. It taught him, as my own experiences have taught me, never to do anything with the motivation of helping people. If you do that, you will be disappointed and hurt when those same people turn on you despite what you did for them. Instead, do what you know to be right, and by doing so, people are helped as a result. When they turn against you, the dynamic is different. You didn't do it for them. You did it because you knew it was the right thing to do. Your relationship is not with individuals. It is with doing what is right and just and fair, because it is right and just and fair, irrespective of the people involved. That is how I live my life to this day. There's a lot to unpick there. For Ike, the right action is the right action, regardless of consequences. People and their reactions be damned. If he truly believes this, it explains why he burned his career to the ground to expose the cult. Moral philosophers would call this philosophy deontological, and it can be contrasted with utilitarianism, where the right action is determined by the expected consequences of an action and seeks actions which will deliver the best or least bad outcome. Deontology is associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant, making Ike a total Kant. In Ike's case, we can see a bit of a drawback to this noble moral philosophy. Ike is adamant that he's right, even when the evidence against him is insurmountable. Ike regularly makes wild claims that which are easily disproven or shown to be exaggerations with an even a cursory Google search. He's wrong about an all-powerful cult controlling the world, and he has no special knowledge about reincarnation, life after death, or any other woo about which he claims to possess special knowledge. If he'd listened to some of the pushback he was getting when he declared himself son of the Godhead in 1991, he could have spared himself and his family the ordeal of public mockery he endured. Possibly he could have even saved his career in broadcasting or politics. It's unlikely, but who knows? Let Ike be a cautionary tale. Make sure you're actually right before saying damn the consequences. Let's move on to what Ike has to say about himself and his childhood. Ike brags a lot throughout the book, and definitely fancies himself as an exemplary individual. They say the animals are always the first to know, and Ike writes, Another fear of mine as a kid was dogs, and when I walked anywhere, they always seemed to make me their target for their attention and barking. Once I realised how reality works, I understood why. They were picking up the energy I was giving off. I love dogs today. Their eyes and faces are magical. I mean, yeah, man. What can I say? Dogs like people. <laughs> Ike recalls not possessing a lot of confidence in early life which I suppose we could attribute to an overbearing father. Through my early years and when I first went to school, I kept myself to myself, with my head down, and lived life as the also ran I thought that it was my destiny to be. It never occurred to me that anything special would ever happen. Special, different, and successful were only for others. My hand-to-mouth life experience in the 1950s and early 1960s just confirmed that my present would be my future. Keeping myself to myself spending time alone, and enjoying my privacy, has been a lifelong trait which is rather ironic, given that almost everything I have done since I was 15 has been in the public eye in some way. Subsequently, this has been to withdraw from the public stage between public things that I do. As a kid, I was simply hiding from the world. I was shy in the extreme, had little to say, and my mother would laugh at me crossing the street to avoid even saying hello to someone. Despite this early lack of confidence, Ike asserts that he felt a sense of importance from an early age. From somewhere deep inside, from an early age, I felt I had come to do something. Like a destiny, if you like. It was coming from a different place to my conscious lack of belief in myself. It was there as a feeling more than a thought. As we've established previously, Ike doesn't see coincidences, but synchronicities. Everything happens for a larger reason. No event is a random act of chance. Everything has great importance. Take the meaning he derives here from a performance in a school play as a six-year-old, for example. I had an experience in infant school about that same time, maybe 1958, that both typified me in that period and gave me a spooky precursor of where my life was much later to go. I was in a school play, and of course, I played the starring role. I was a tree. Teacher's pet Graham Glover was the prince in our rendition of Sleeping Beauty, and good luck to him. The thought of saying lines in public would have been catastrophic for me. I was with a group of others dressed in brown trousers, green tops, and something on our heads supposed to symbolise branches. 
The idea was that the prince would cut down the trees with his make-believe scythe, and we would fall down as he passed. I was playing it for real, and Graham Glover never came near me, so I thought, how can I fall down when he's so far away? That would be silly. All the other trees fell down no matter where he was, and I was left standing on my own. The audience of parents and teachers started to titter, and then to belly laugh. I stood there thinking, why are they laughing? He didn't come near me, so how could I fall? The symbolism of refusing to fall down while everyone laughed at me was a sign of things to come. The next day I was called out by the, of class by the headmistress, Miss Wilkinson. Think of a classic headmistress of the 1950s and you got her. Tall, wide, tweed skirt and jacket, and her shoulders so big she predated shoulder pads without any need to have them. She leaned over me like Cruella de Vil and launched into a rant about how I had made the play look foolish, the school look foolish, and myself look foolish. It was like that old joke about an inflatable boy who stabbed an inflatable headmaster, an inflatable school, and then stabbed himself. The headmaster said, You've let me down, you've let the school down, and worst of all, you've let yourself down. Well, I laughed anyway. Miss Wilkinson and the play were yet more blows for my self-esteem, but what a precursor and preparation for what was to come. Now, you or I, not inclined to believe we have some grand cosmic destiny, would probably shrug that off as funny but unfair incident from childhood. Ike sees it as important, training him for what lies ahead of him, when he'll be pressured and mocked for his message and tempted to back down, but mustn't for the sake of humanity, lest the evil cult win. Ike explains this best himself, writing, Our expanded awareness beyond the simulation, beyond the perception of the five senses, can view the whole river from source to sea. What means one thing to body-mind means something very different to expanded awareness. For example, the canoe might spring a leak and you paddle to the shore furious at your bad luck. Then someone comes over to you and says, My God, you are lucky. There's a big waterfall around the next corner. These situations have happened to me throughout my life, and not only since my initial consciousness awakening in 1990. I began to recognize them after that, but they had been happening since I was a young kid. They appeared to be just coincidences and bits of luck until I became aware enough to see the pattern and realized that something strange was happening that could not be explained by mere coincidence. The revelation would be decades away, however, as I made my way through the school system. In a third year at Whitehall, I was told by the fourth year football teacher to ask my own class teacher for permission to take part in the weekly football training afternoon, which fourth year boys had written into their curriculum. I asked the first week, and he said yes. And then the second week when I was out playing in goal, a kid from my class came over and said I had to return immediately. When I did, I was humiliated in front of everyone by a morose asshole of a teacher. I thought permission had been given to go to football every week. He didn't. Something inexplicable followed. I sat down at my desk and he set a class spelling test. Now, I'm not bad at spelling these days, through decades of repetition, and there's always spell check. In my school days, I was useless. At the end of the class, the teacher announced the spelling test results. Somehow, somehow, I had come top. What? Me? At spelling? I must say I enjoyed his embarrassment amid my own incredulity, when he had to reveal that the boy he had just lambasted in front of everyone, and didn't think was very bright, had won his test. It was from here that I began to develop a fuck you attitude to anyone who sought to belittle me and put me down. It came in handy after 1990. That same year, with that same teacher, I came top of the class in the end of year exams for the single time in my life. It was the only point in my school career that I had ever really tried. Like many school children before him, and since him, Ike admits he didn't enjoy school. Ike, look this way, and Ike, stop daydreaming, was a regular response from the teachers trying to fill my head with maths, ugh, or whatever. My mind was only on the job with English, writing, not the rest of it, history and geography. The rest passed me by. Although, Ike also writes, Most of what interested me, like history, I have spent decades unlearning because it simply wasn't true, or at the very least, only partly so. Ike's school years were consumed by football. Football was the overwhelming bright spot of his school years, and for good reason. Ike was, after all, a professional footballer by 15 years of age. Ike writes, I moved to Whitehall Junior School next door and my life and demeanour eventually began to change, thanks to football. The tarmac playground was on a slight incline. 
and we used to play a game we called uppers and downers. Someone kicked a plastic football in the air, shouted uppers and downers, and everyone chose which team they wanted to play for, the ups or the downs. The teams could be seriously uneven as a result, but it sort of worked. I was attracted from the start by the position of goalkeeper, which was rare. Most kids wanted to score goals, while I wanted to stop them. The playground is still there, as is the infant school hall where my tree refused to fall. I was walking into school one day when I saw a notice on the board asking for anyone interested in a trial for the school third year football team to add their name. I didn't think for a second to do so. Play for the school team? I would never get in. So what's the point? I was walking home alone shortly afterwards when a boy ran after me shouting for me to stop. He said the football teacher, Mr. Rickard, that's how you pronounced it anyway, wanted me to go to the trial for the team the next day. He said that he'd seen me play in goal in the playground. I ran home so excited to tell my father. With only that night before the trial for the school team, Ike was forced to try out in old and ill-fitting boots, the only thing available to him at the last minute. I went for the trial the next day as a goalkeeper with my boots attracting great hilarity. Another boy was picked in goal and I had to somehow get into the team playing outfield. It came down to me and one other kid for the last position, and Mr. Rickard decided to have us both take a shot at goal and the one with the most powerful shot would get in. Well, this was going to be a no contest. I had boots with toe caps that could have launched missiles. I kicked the ball, toe cap first, and it begged for mercy when contact was made. I was in. I can't tell you the rush of self-esteem this gave a little boy without any up to that point. My eyes still water thinking about it even today. My god, I can achieve things. I scored in my first game for the school, a goal my father missed. He tended to leave home just when he was supposed to arrive somewhere else. When he did come, I ran over to him shouting, I scored, I scored! Mind you, that was not such a great achievement given that we had won 16-0 against a Catholic school called the Nuri, who were to football what Bill Gates is to human decency. Soon afterwards, the goalkeeper picked in front of me went to play for the fourth year team, and I was now in goal. I decided immediately what I wanted to be. A professional footballer. What an ambition for the kid who two weeks earlier thought he would never amount to anything. I played for the fourth year team the next season, and we won a cup in which all the schools in Leicester could enter. It was an incredible achievement. Hey, this Ike kid might not be an also ran after all. Oh, ho, ho, ho. What a neat little jab at old Billy Gates from Ike there. In 1963, Ike moved on to Crown Hill Secondary Modern, still determined to be a professional footballer and holding no interest in schoolwork. I was getting a bit rebellious by now. Schoolwork bored me, and I couldn't see how much of it would ever be of use in the life I had in mind. Thankfully, four years later, Ike's dedication to football would pay off. Ike explains how he got his start in professional football. I played for Crown Hill's football teams for three years, many times outfield in the first two, and my chances to be a footballer were disappearing. To be seen by scouts at professional clubs, you had to be playing for your city representative team. The thought was that if you couldn't get into your city team, you couldn't be of good enough to be of interest to football clubs. I was nowhere near doing that. Then came the break that set me on the road to the ambition that began with those giant boots years earlier. There was a trial for the Leicester School's under-14 team, and my sports teacher, a great, a great guy called Mr. Stone, sent me along with a few others. The catch was that he sent me as an outfield player. It was taken for granted that the goalkeeper selected would be a boy called Dave Valance. He was already playing a year up for the under-15 Leicester School's team, and naturally he would be picked for his own age group as well. I turned up on a cold and misty morning with the grass dripping with dew in an area now known as Ellis Meadows, and I think connected at the time to the old John Ellis School. They played games of half an hour with different groups of trialists, and I was pretty useless outfield at this level. My heart wasn't in it. I was a goalkeeper, and that's all I wanted to be. The teacher in charge told about four of us to go and kick a ball around on an area away from the pitch, and he would call us back if he needed us again. It was clearly, thanks, but... No thanks. I walked away, pondering on where my ambition could possibly go from here. About five minutes later, I heard a shout from the teacher in the distance. Hey, any of you lads playing goal? I was running towards him in a flash. Yes, I do. The other goalkeeper with Valance had been injured and I took over. I did okay, and the teacher told me afterwards that I should come to the next trial because we need a reserve goalkeeper to Dave Valance. Well... 
The next trial took the form of a full game between two teams of the surviving trialists, and the selection produced one team far more talented than the other with me and the other. I was bombarded with shots from all angles for the totality of the game, and it was one of those days where if I had dived the wrong way, the ball would have hit me somehow and stayed out. I was inspired. My goal was battered throughout, and only one shot went past me. Talk about the performance of my life at exactly the right time. The teacher manager, to be fair, said that as I had played so well in the trial, he had to pick me for the team. We had a strange situation in which Valance was playing for the under-15 team, and yet couldn't get into the under-14 teams. A scout from Arsenal Football Club saw me playing for the team a few weeks later, and I went on trial there during the week that England won the World Cup in 1966 for the only time. The whole England squad came over to the Arsenal training ground in the week before the final at Wembley, when the players not in the main team played a training game against Arsenal. I stood on the touchline alongside these world-famous players including the captain Bobby Moore and my hero, the then Leicester City goalkeeper, Gordon Banks. What a dream for a kid who loved football. I had learned the skills of goalkeeping by watching Banks week after week from behind the goal at Leicester's former ground, Filbert Street. Arsenal asked me to sign what were called schoolboy forms with them, but my father wanted to hold on. Another famous goalkeeper that I knew in schools played football in Leicester was Peter Shilton, who played for the Leicester City first team at just 16, and went on to play more games for England than any other player, and holds the all-time record for the most competitive appearances in world football. I could have signed for Leicester, but at that time, Gordon Banks was in the first team, and Peter Shilton was his reserve, and I thought it was best to go somewhere else. I was picked ahead of Dave Valance for the under-15s Leicester boys team the next season and for the Leicester County Schools team. Everything took off. I was recommended for trials by scouts for Liverpool, Nottingham Forest, Blackpool, Millwall and others. My father was adamant that he wanted me to have a first trial with Coventry City, then managed by a flamboyant character called Jimmy Hill. He had taken them from third division obscurity to the top division in the season that I joined them in 1967. I played only half an hour in the trial game before they offered me a full-time contract. Coventry was 25 miles from Leicester, and it meant that I could get home at weekends after matches. Here I was, six years after my Big Boots trial at Whitehall, leaving school behind to be a professional footballer. Would that have happened without the goalkeeper getting injured at Leicester under-14 trial, after I had already been rejected? A great deal less likely, it is fair to say. These are the coincidences and bits of luck which have peppered my life throughout. Success in football had saved me. God knows what I would have done otherwise. Even as a kid, the thought of working in a factory or office, where most from my school ended up, was excruciating. I did not have the mind for that. Where would we be without people working in factories and offices in terms of production and organisation? I know that, and I am not knocking those that take that path. It's just that I would have died of boredom, and I knew that from a very young age. Thank goodness for football which gave me a way out. And so, Ike's football career begins. I will say this, even for someone like myself who has no interest in football, Ike's writing is most entertaining when he's writing about his football career. The passion is evident. I felt like it was enjoyable enough to read, but now that I think about it, it might have just been that I was enjoying the calm before the storm. Ike continues the story of his football career in Chapter 2, entitled Guided Through the Maze. I chose to omit most of it because I'm not that interested in Ike's football career, but there are some bits and pieces I didn't want to let pass without comment. For instance, Ike uses the tale of an injury to his knee he sustained during training to inject some melodrama into the book. A vital preparation for where my life would go was to become incredibly emotionally strong. I wouldn't otherwise survive where my path would take me. Anyone who couldn't deal with an unyielding emotional onslaught, let alone mere disappointment, would go under fast in the wake of what was to come for me. Life so often gives you your greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as your worst nightmare. Look at your own life, and you'll see how the bad times gave you the confidence to become wiser, more empathetic, and emotionally strong. I have had many emotional blows and disappointments in my life, with many great moments too to give me the emotional strength to keep me going, no matter what is thrown my way. These experiences can destroy you, or make you emotionally unbreakable. It's your choice. I chose the latter. 
You only survived my father's short fuse personality if you had the emotional strength, and it started early for me, exactly as pre-planned. Personally, I think that's pretty heavy considering it wasn't a serious injury, and it was over 50 years ago. As strange as it is, these passages where Ike sounds more like a self-help author extolling the benefits of emotional resilience than he does a conspiracy theorist raving about lizard people pop up throughout the book. I hope he has a pocket book of Dave's wisdom in the web store soon. Throughout The Trap, Ike isn't shy about the fact that he believes he has unique knowledge about the nature of reality. I mean, to be fair, it is the premise of the whole book. In this passage, Ike recalls an incident from his football days where he believed all was not as it appeared. There was one incident that season that gave me a powerful insight into the fact that the reality we think we see is not all there is. I have been open to that all my life, although this was my first direct experience. We were playing a cup game at Barnett at the old Underhill ground in North London. It was packed that night, and one hell of an atmosphere. Newcastle giant killing Hereford United were quite a draw at the time. I remember the ball falling to a Barnett player about 15 yards from goal, and he hit it for the first time with terrific power. Often as a goalkeeper you think, this is in, when the ball is hit, and then somehow you keep it out. This was one such occasion. I saw the ball leave his foot in real time, but then everything went into slow motion. Sound became silence as I moved across to my left, towards the direction of the ball. I launched myself from the ground as the ball headed to the top left-hand corner, all in slow motion to my experience and with no sound. I arched my head back, and I saw my right hand touch the ball and divert it just enough to go an inch or so over the bar. The moment I touched the ball, everything surged back into normal speed, and the sound of the crowd crashed back in like pressing the unmute button. As I landed, and teammates ran over to say, Great save, Ikey! I lay there thinking, What on earth just happened? Well, perhaps not, what on earth? That experience never left me, and I can still say it now as I write. It was the best save I ever made. Blimey, I thought. There is more to this world than we think. Oh yes. Rather than some insight into the nature of reality to blow our heads open, we just have another instance of Ike encountering a genuinely interesting phenomenon and coming away from it with the wrong conclusions. Our brains construct our reality, that is to say, they interpret reality for us. We've all experienced moments of intense focus, where the rest of the world drops away and leaves us totally engaged with the task at hand. Or time flying when we're having fun. In this instance, Ike hasn't discovered something about reality, but something about his brain. In times of stress, the area of the brain called the amygdala becomes more active and starts producing memories in addition to the areas of the brain which are normally responsible for memories. It's comparable to a film camera. If you think of your brain as a camera, and in daily life you're wandering around catching everything in 24 frames a second, the amygdala is what kicks everything up to 60 frames a second. More frames equals greater detail equals the feeling that time is passing at a slower rate than usual. It's pretty neat, really. Naturally, Ike mentions a lot of football players he played alongside or against throughout his football career. Unfortunately, because Ike played football 50 years ago and in another country, all of the names were lost on me. I didn't have any interest in looking further into any of them until Ike, presumably never having heard of the Streisand effect, wrote this about his team captain at Oxford Union, Ron Atkinson. His TV career was destroyed by the political correctness mob when he made an apparently racist remark when he thought the microphone was off. PC tyranny has no forgiveness and no mistake is allowed. They have to destroy you. It's what they do. I say the remark was apparently racist. While it was not at all nice to say the least, I knew Ron Atkinson in a number of football and TV situations here and there over the years, and the last thing he was is a racist. It was he who gave black players their big break when he managed West Bromwich Albion and built a team around them. None of this mattered. The PC mob is consumed by its deluded sense of self-righteousness, and once it smells blood, it has to taste it too. Lift the mask from the self-righteous and you always find they are everything they rail against. How could I possibly resist the impulse to look further into that? An article from 2004 in The Guardian covers the incident and it reads, Ron Atkinson, the ITV football pundit, yesterday resigned after racist comments about the Chelsea player Marcel de Sailly were broadcast around the world. The remarks, 
made when viewers in Britain were watching post-match analysis of the Monaco v Chelsea Champions League semi-final first leg match, were broadcast in several places in the Middle East, including Dubai and Egypt. Referring to the underwhelming performance of the French defender, Atkinson said, He's what is known in some schools as a fucking lazy thick N-word. Atkinson's conversation was picked up by microphones that should have been switched off once the broadcast from the stadium had concluded. See, if I were Ike's editor, my second question after what the fuck, David, would be when you wrote that Ron's comment was apparently racist, did you mean to write it was obviously racist? Also, I don't think telling the readers he had plenty of black friends is going to give him the pass you think it is. It would have cost Ike nothing to leave this out of the book, and here we are, and Ike has decided to defend the use of the N-word. Atkinson may have given black players a start when he managed a team, even built the team around them as star players, but he was also in a position where he had a vested interest in their success and was going to benefit from the skills and talent of those players. I'm starting to question David Ike's judgement, guys. All good things must come to an end, and Ike's football career was no exception. After developing unexplained pain and swelling, Ike was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. He writes, The inevitable happened when I was given the news that I probably had rheumatoid arthritis and my career was over. I was just 19. What had started with those big boots at Whitehall had run its course, or so it seemed. Obviously, I was gutted. The worst part was driving back to Leicester to tell my father. He had lived a very challenging life, and I knew what a buzz it gave him to have me break the mould in a way. He walked out to meet me from the gents' clock factory, where I went with my mother as a kid to get that week's pay on a Thursday lunchtime. It was a horrible moment. My father did have a trait that led him in the wake of disappointment to take his anger and frustration out on someone, and this time it was me. Our relationship broke down for years after this as a result, and even when it was patched up, it was never really the same again. During this time, Ike, already sceptical of medicine, or at least so he claims, eschewed the use of non anti-inflammatory drugs, and at the suggestion of his then-wife Linda, experimented with acupuncture. Despite Ike's claims of the acupuncture's effectiveness, the end of Ike's career was inevitable. Despite his diagnosis at 19, Ike, to his credit, was able to play through the pain for a few more years. However, Ike eventually reached the point where he just couldn't go on. He writes, The end of my football career ironically came between seasons, in the summer of 1973. In the last few weeks of the previous season, the pain had gone, and I could actually warm up again almost normally every morning. The spring temperatures helped, but it was more than that. I had just turned 21 and signed a new contract with Hereford as we were headed into Division 3 when the end finally came. I was getting into bed one night, I looked down at my left knee to see that it wasn't swollen for the first time since that blow in the thigh in 1968. My god, I've cracked it, I thought. It's gone. The next morning I woke up in a half-sleep and realised that I couldn't breathe, or move. I tried to knock Linda lying beside me. Nothing happened. I was like frozen rigid. I was sure I was going to die until eventually I gasped a breath, and immediately feeling surge back through my body a feeling that knives were being thrust into every joint. I went to bed a professional footballer, and I woke up never to play again. Linda had to help me even to the toilet for the first three days. No lower joint would work, and when I tried it was excruciating. I hoped that it would settle down again before the next season started in a couple of months. While it improved, it was never enough to play. The club hospital doctor advised me to stop playing, Not that I needed to be told when I simply couldn't play by then. When I tried to start pre-season training, the pain was too much, and I couldn't hide it anymore. The manager, Colin Addison, asked to meet me in his office one lunchtime, and the hour before I got the verdict from the hospital. What followed was a bizarre interaction, in which he was telling me that he didn't think I was trying hard enough in training, and I was telling him my career was over. It took a while for him to hear me. Thank you for listening to another episode of Ike Land. If you'd like to contact me, 
including with corrections, you can email me at ikelandpodcast at gmail.com. Next time, we'll continue on with our reading of Ike's book, The Trap. Until next time, remember the eyes and faces of dogs. They are magical.